hear me? I can, John. Good. Good. All right. I'm going to mute and let you guys get to work. Thank you. All right. We're good to go, Barry. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, back to our weekly webinars on how to reduce chemical usage and grow healthy turf and other landscape plants. Um, tonight, tonight's a pretty cool. I mean, things. Our, our speaker tonight is Mike Stangle from Canada, and I didn't know anything about Mike up until about three weeks ago. And I just stumbled across him on the internet, and pretty interesting guy. What he's been doing for years and years has been, you know, what he calls regenerative turf systems, and it is basically working with the soils, getting the soils healthy so you can grow healthier plants. Um, another thing, you know, everything's connected to everything else. Um, on his website, he has a, a quote there from uh, Dr. White, the professor from Rutgers, who gave a talk here on, on the microbes in the soil and how they, they work with uh, making plants healthy. So again, there's all these kinds of connections. So with that, Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Barry. And I wanna thank Barry for the, the invite today. I'm gonna to try and make this entertaining at the same time uh, educational. And like Barry was mentioning, uh, James, if you can watch their uh, video, uh, I watched it today quickly. I know a lot of his videos are reoccurring information, but it, it really extends to what we're doing here in this industry, especially with the turf. Um, I was like Barry, I had the opportunity talking with James multiple times and the turf itself with the endophytes, you can do a lot more magic with the endophytes with turf than a lot of other industries, but let's start again. Thank you, Barry. I'm going to uh, go to the first and it's been a while since I've done one of these uh, presentations. Last year, I did it for the Ontario Farmers Association here for uh, regenerative. Um, I was communicating with them about soil health. They didn't understand the biology was the curator of the soil. So here I am. Uh, I started back in uh, 1981 at the age of 16. This is my truck uh, back in uh, 1985. So we established 1981. I'm one of you guys, I use sprays, that's a split tank. I had herbicide on one side, insecticide on the other, and the fertilizer in the back. I did that day in and day out. If you go to my website, you can see a little outline of my history from 1981 all the way to current. And if you wanna follow it, go ahead. There's a lot of great information and a lot of great courses that I had taken. And the majority of the courses that I had taken or since 2009 with our ban up here in Ontario for cosmetic use of pesticides, which means we can't use herbicides or insecticides. We gotta use alternatives. So it, this is on the website, I don't wanna go through it. As you can see, back in the day, I used fertilizer. There's a nice truck and you'll get to see that truck again. I got one more picture, two more pictures, but there I am in the background. I have my boots, respirator, gloves, the hose. I'm spraying Durasban on this day and it was quite hot and I was going for grubs and this is August in our area. I'm in St. Catharines. Uh, to the east of me is Niagara Falls. To the west is Hamilton. North is Lake Ontario and south is Lake Erie. So we're close to Buffalo if you want to uh, talk about relationship to weather and location. Now you can see me without my gloves on. Okay, it must have been hot that day, but I still have my respirator on. So this is 1985. And if you can tell on the truck, we don't have stickers on the truck. That was actually painted logo <laughs> back then. We never had that high tech shit back, <laughs> back then. But long and short, there was, this is one of the reasons I went regenerative. I was starting to go organic and I found that I was coming home with uh, toxicity. I was getting uh, dilated pupils, headaches, and dizziness, and it was quite regular. So we were doing on average 100,000 square feet a day, five days a week, and that would be from April to uh, October, obviously. So the herbicides uh, would have been May and August, and then in between, and then our insecticides would have been August, September, and we would have had a spring one too for chinch, sod webworm, cutworm, armyworm, 
uh, even if we were trying to go after some issues with uh, grubs, I would have done a spring one just to, more so to keep the skunks from digging. So this is basically what I just said, you know, from conventional fertilizers and sprays to regenerative processes, you'll find it's your mindset that governs the management that you're doing. And I find that with consumers too. Uh, consumers are related to fertilizer from past experiences, meaning that when we put a fertilizer on, they, they understand that the outcome is gonna be fast growing grass. So they're already pre-plant or pre-sold. So I can walk up to anyone, I could sell them a fertilizer or a herbicide at any time or an insecticide because it's grained in them from the last 30 to 70 years from the farm to the actual home. So it comes down to what you know and what you're looking at in the whole. That includes the biology and the foremost is the fungus. So in that third sentence there, what I'm trying to get across to you is when you go regenerative, it's not just looking out, out, out at outcomes, it's looking at what's in the soil because the soil is the heart of the plant. Not only the heart, it's the stomach. And that biology within that soil is supposed to be the same biology in our bio. So within our own stomach, that's why we were told as kids to go out and play in the dirt. But again, dirt, if you define it, dirt is empty, void of life, where a soil is teeming with life. And that's where we see these commercials or we're talking about, consumers are talking about dirt. They literally are talking about dirt for the number of fertilizers and sprays that you put on, you're killing off what is in that stomach. Now, everything that's rooted in the soil will re get rewarded from a regenerative outcome from the, the person's front flower bed to the tree. And I think there's some sport fields here, um, guys from the sport fields, but you'll find that you'll get more out of a sport field on a regenerative outcome than with fertilizers by far. The f down here, it says there are no recipes nor magic wands. There isn't, I love recipes. I loved it back in the day when I can go to my calendar and I said, May is for uh, herbicides. June, I could go an insecticide. You know, we had it outlined. I worked for a Cherry Hill golf course, which back in the 70s was the Canada, Canada Open there played a few times. I was coming in with an ATV back in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was spraying um, Mecaprop more so to, to reduce their actual clover and their roughs, semi roughs. And uh, it was about five, six years of doing that until they got their own sprayer. And you would have thought they'd had their sprayer. But what I was trying to get at is clover is a very important plant and an indicator in the soil. We'll get to that down the road. You know, and in the last sentence, nature can be influenced. So why not build soil health, teeming with life for greater resilience? When you look at, again, in a regenerative mode, a regenerative outcome, we're always building soil health. Soil health is not the application of a fertilizer, okay? Our fertilizers that we call professional or professional grade or Scots is salt. And when we put that salt on, we're literally destroying the heart of the soil. As salt diets to us destroy our hearts, we are destroying the soil itself. There's other uh, avenues of using fertilizers such as uh, kelp, uh, fish, uh, humic. There's lots of things you can use but decrease the amount of salt and you'll find that your resilience in the plant will actually increase. And you'll find that as I go along, I'm starting to get back into the flow and the rhythm. I'll read these better. Um, there's my truck. I retired it. We don't use it anymore. <laughs> so I just use it as a summer driver. Um, the reason why is because I don't need that size of a truck. And you'll see, I went to a European, actually a Japanese Toyotas up here, uh, three, no, two liter diesel and I have a three liter diesel. Those trucks are very economical and feasible. And that's when I went regenerative. I looked at everything to reduce my bottom line. I'm not wanting the petrol guys to get my hard earned dollars. I'm going out there every day, spraying, coming home dizzy and everything else. So that truck sits most of the time and I gave it to my 18 year old son. So that's his thing now. Um, and it runs beautifully. It's only 220,000 kilometers on it, which is 120,000 miles. Let's get back into what we're going. So back in the um, 2000s, even the 90s, I was looking at why weeds grew. And I was always out there and I lost customers. We got up to 1,500 customers. And within that, we had a lot more headaches. 
we had people call and we got weeds, get out there, spray. And literally I would ask the agronomists, I would ask our guys up here at Guelph University, okay, what can we do here? Just go out and spray herbicide. And I just didn't take that verbatim. I said, there's gotta be a reason. So I found out in the 2000s that it was mainly because of the disturbances that we're doing to the soil, you know, such as the conventional farming practices or what we're doing to it, um, say landscaping. You know, there's tilling, fertilizer sprays. So from landscaping, if we actually rip off a lawn, we destroy that connection. You're literally taking the head off of, a, off of our bodies and saying, okay, I'm gonna put it back with another head and watch it grow. It doesn't do that. You really will destroy the soil and you've got to set it up. So the disturbances for our subdivisions, even to the sport fields, um, I'm not sure how your universities are developed down there, but some of our universities were from, set up on farms. And then what they've done is they've uh, gone in and excavated the farms or they sold the farms off for subdivisions here. And then they brought these big, huge land scrapers, scraped all the soil up and put it to the side, to the edge. That's literally like going to your house. And we have basements here, so I'm not, not sure where you guys are. So if I'm gonna go work on my plumbing job, I bring a bulldozer on in, I push the house to the side, I go down and do the plumbing job and then push the house back and say, there you go, go back and live in the house. We're doing that to the plants that we're trying to grow in the soil. You're literally destroying that association with that stomach. And then you just throw another plant in from, a, well, it's sod. A lot of the sod comes from chemical fields. So you're throwing a chemical plant back on a soil that can't be, so it needs life support. That life support is your fertilizers and sprays. You know, so disturbances are then caused by the guys from after the excavation of the house. If you've seen, we've got foundations or whatever foundation, they're destroying it. And then the builders, you know, like I said, they pile the dirt up over there, then they bring it back in and try and skim it. Well, that's an anaerobic pile of dirt, which means you've shifted all the life from aerobic to an anaerobic state, which is the chemistry as well. In that chemistry, you're gonna have more nitrate. And then that nitrate, you're gonna get flushes of weeds. The weed's job is to proliferate. We all know that because we see it year after year after year, but its job was to proliferate for a reason. It's, I'm gonna go to the dandelion again. The dandelion is a scavenger of calcium. So that root goes down looking for the calcium down far, but brings it back up, pulls it into the leaf. So that is actual dandelion, is an actual herb. I don't want to get too far ahead of me because I know what I've got ahead in the slides here. But that dandelion, when it grows and it dies, grows and it dies, it's doing something specific there. It's breaking open compaction. It pulled up the calcium, created a debris field. The leaf is now uh, breaking down through microarthropods, the worms, excuse me. And then you're getting all of the, the micro, sorry, the, uh, the biology, uh, I lost my train of thought. We're getting the minerals, that's the word I'm looking at, back into the soil. But where the root now, have, what happens to the root is it starts dying off. And within that root, you're gonna have the uh, worms eating it, again, the microarthropods, the fungus going after it, the uh, biology such as bacteria, and then you're going to have the nematodes uh, starting to set camp up, and you're going to have the protozoa in there, which are going to eat the protozoa, sorry, which are going to eat the uh, bacteria. Still a little nervous, guys, so I'm going to you have to allow <laughs> me to get into this. So you're going to, it's going to eat the bacteria, it's going to eat the fungus, and what you're going to get is that nutrient cycling happening. What I'm trying to get at is the builders, you know, then they leave it up to the homeowner to fertilize and spray. Again, this is my first time doing this presentation. I want, really wanted to do it well. It looks like I'm kind of screwing it up, but we'll go with the flow here. Basically, the builders know how to build, but they don't dirt about soil. And I say that to a lot of people, they know dirt. Basically, again, our soil is broken, lifeless, compacted dirt. And when we throw the fertilizer on, you're putting flushes of nitrate on, you're forcing these weeds to grow. These weeds got a job to do every seed in the world and I should say the location you're in is in your lawn or in your flower bed or there and ready to grow. It'll only grow 
dependent upon the biology or the disturbances you have caused to set succession backwards for that biology now to set up to move forward successionally. And within that, you're gonna get a successional plant growing such as the dandelion, which is a mycorrhizal plant. If you didn't know, it's a lower species of a plant, but that mycorrhizal, once you start putting it back into your lawn, it'll start going after that weed and draining it of its minerals and support a higher plant such as the grass. So you'll start seeing populations of weeds decrease just along with mycorrhizal introducing back into the soil. And again, I mentioned this earlier, weeds are the scavengers for the minerals to create balance. If we can look at succession, if you've never seen a succession chart, and that's from rock to a uh, climax forest, there's every plant that stands like a soldier in line and everyone has a job and every area on your field or on your home is not the same. And within that disturbance, you're going to have an outcome. And that outcome is based on the biology's uh, chemistry that is being produced by what is there, be it an anaerobic, facultative, which is, can work in both an anaerobic, low oxygen, or aerobic, which is high oxygen. Ooh. So the dandelion root, I know some will say to go to three feet, others will say to go to 15 feet, but it's, it's supposed to be scavenging for calcium. There's, uh, we have a plant up here called Creepin' Charlie that has been going, taking off the last few years with our rain events. Our soils are clogging up or, or uh, our field is actually getting too wet. And within that, the Creepin' Charlie is running runners out. They love high iron. And if there's a book that you should get, if you haven't already gotten it, uh, you can see that. It's called Weeds and Why They Grow. And within it, you will have 800 different weeds, their names, and everything based on chemistry, why it's growing. So if you will go to Dandelion for fun, right away, it's telling me it's got low calcium, very low. And then over here, it's got high potassium. And when I said the high potassium, what happens is when you start building soils, okay, especially with clay soils, the clay, the clay is like the clay molecules, the clay uh, heads are sitting like this in a book. They're tight, they're bound, they're compacted. There's no organic matter, there's no light to flocculate the soil. So what happens is when I start reading a good book, and this is a great book and I didn't want to ruin it, I dog ear everything. So when I dog ear everything, I start getting space forming. And basically when you start increasing life within the soil, organic matter starts building within that clay. You start getting natural flocculation. You start getting expansion within the soil. And what happens is the potassium is stuck in between. It starts coming available. Now you're gonna get a flush of weeds coming up. That's a visual saying you're doing something right and you've got to educate the consumer or understand that you're doing something right. And understand that calcium, the crystal is too large to fit between the clay and that's why it flushes off. And that's why people have to put lime on calcium carbonate. Um, just to give you a story about that, back in the day, if when Rome wanted to enter into a country, what they first do is, or go to war with a country, the first thing they did was go to their farm fields and salt their fields with lime and gypsum. Okay, they did that to Carthage three times. And then they went to North Africa because they killed their soil by tillage and all the salts. And then they started, um, they took the people of Carthage, took them as slaves, farmed it. And then after a few um, decades, they started up from tilling. They saw that the drop in mineralization and everything else, the biology. So they went back to salts and they literally destroyed themselves. Where are they today? That's what I was trying to communicate with earlier is with the root. When the root starts dying off, it's going to turn into an organic matter. But it's an avenue and a runway for more air, which biology requires, and water to get down there equally. So you're breaking open. This is free aeration. You might not look at it that way, but it's free aeration. And at the other end, it's producing uh, more organic matter, and it's giving you the mineral base that you require at the surface. 
I already said this, weeds are herbs, adding plant diversity to build dirt into soil, teeming with life. They're not a threat, but a tool for which nature uses to fix the dirt, always successionally moving forward. And then again, successionally meaning every plant stands in line. Grass is a higher successional plant than more of your, well, all your annual weeds into your perennials. So once you start getting your fungus, and more specifically your mycorrhizal picked up, you'll find that these weeds will be here and there. And it's okay. Again, I tell my consumer that when I eat too much chocolate, I get a pimple. That's just a sign I eat too much chocolate. And again, you look at the weeds, you ID them. I always carry books around. I've got three of these, one in the truck, one in the house, and one in my office here. I don't like retaining all this information all the time, so I'll just uh, read my book. And just to show you about the dandelion, since 2009, our university here at Windsor has been studying the dandelion because it can actually, um, as a cancer therapy, cure cancer. The Eastern cultures use dandelion tea. I have a cup of dandelion tea per month. Ever since I had toxicity from the sprays, the Durazban, Diazinon, Dacbell, everything from the 80s all the way up. I mean, yeah, we've had some harsh stuff. And then that's the other thing. It's the applicator who's gonna end up with an outcome, either an illness or a cancer. And that's what we gotta look at. When we're in a lawn care company or, in, or the guy out there, my wife works for a lung uh, surgeon up here the street. And we get to see, um, uh, she gets to see patients by the way. A lot of the greenhouses up here, we use workers from out of country, Mexico, islands. A lot of those guys are coming through with long issues from the products they're using. It was just in the last two years that we're getting uh, better uh, protective gear for these guys because the greenhouse owners don't want to do it. The farmers don't want to do it. They get their workers coming in from migrant workers coming in and they're spraying it. And we're finding they've got a lot of lung issues right now. And then they get sent home and they got no medical down there. It does, it, I don't know, it's just hard on your body. So again, weeds grow to fill in bare areas. So obviously, you know, seed some of those areas, fill in the barriers, protecting it. But the other thing is um, if you're really down south, the soil grass and all that, we get, we're cool season up here. So we get a crab grass to grow. I'll show you later on a picture of temperatures on lawns that we've got. And the long and the short, crabgrass grows up here for a reason. And the reason is the soil got too hot. And within that, biology will start shifting successionally lower. And within that, the chemistry will change, signaling through nature to, for crabgrass to grow. And what's crabgrass gonna do? It's gonna fill in that bare spot, but it's gonna take in that sun, photosynthesize, send sugars down, and keep what life is there moving successionally forward. Got to remember this, every plant is always helping you. It's not a negative. It's not even taking the product or the minerals away from another plant. They're in association. They're actually helping each other here. So changing the conditions, and that's what I was trying to say. Once we start making this healthier, you start getting more fungus in there, change the condition to why that weed grows that we won't have to grow. It works that way. It's very simple. Yet on a home lawn, we kind of get screwed because they scrape the ground, they built the house, they cleaned their paintbrushes on there. So you got legacy issues. Then they bring in a chemical sod. Then they probably laid in fertilizer and sprays for years. And then now when you're trying to change over from a conventional to a regenerative, you've got to go through that movement successionally too. And consumers don't like that. They want everything like a magic wand. They want things gone. Just to remind you what's in the soil, as you can see, sand, silt, clay, air, water. I like it about, you know, 5%. You can really do a lot with 3%. Uh, I took a course here at Kiss the Ground. It was really a, a great course. It allowed me, obviously, well, not in this, you can't tell, to communicate better. But I'm, I'm doing my best here today. And what I was trying to say, look at that clay down here at the bottom. When you get the clay, it looks like that book. Uh, calcium can't hold in there because it'll flush off. And the only thing that can hold on to calcium in your soil is fungus. 
Now, when you start introducing fungus in there, it starts breaking those peds apart, breaking the soil apart. Now you're gonna get organic matter starting to be defined in those areas and you're gonna get that spread. Definitely, if we look at uh, sand from the beach, the brackish areas, you're gonna have issues there because you're not gonna have enough organic matter. And now again, the silt, you know, a lot of oxygen in there. We all know, I'm not talking to uh, first graders here. We know what the soil is. If we look at the soil organic matter, 50, 80% is humus, 5%, 10% uh, dead. Again, this is just to refresh your mind. You guys know all this. So what happens if we, or to the soil organic matter changes on the left, you start getting compaction, lack of infiltration, the um, anaerobic conditions, you get more nitrates. And to look on the right, what happens is you can see the darker soil medium there. That's the organic matter and it's being flushed off by the roots. And that's basically the exudates that James was talking about, building the biology and the biology successfully moving forward. And what I mean by successfully moving forward with them is their life cycles. So they're, they're dying, they're, they're living, they're growing. And that organic matter on average in a regenerative, you can get about a half a percent of organic matter per season, you know, moving into the soil. Uh, long and short, yeah, you just, yeah. It's not, <laughs> we know like healthy soil on the, um, I don't know what side you guys can see the dark soil is healthy soil and there's the dust. Here's a picture on the same lawn. There's crabgrass here in the right at 90 Fahrenheit. And over on the left is 136 Fahrenheit. This is a view from the front. This is uh, this house is just out in front of the Henley, which is a rowing regatta we have here in Canada, which is well recognized. But you can't tell by that house, or if you got lawn care guys here, your consumers don't water. They'll tell you they water, they don't water enough. We could have aerated that. We got to get the organic matter picked up. We should get EM effective microorganisms in there. You can get a uh, biological in there. And I know Barry's got a lot of products. He can help you out with that stuff. Here's what I was talking about, the temperatures. Okay, this is from ag. This is on lawns, this is flower beds everywhere. So you can see it's 70, 100% moisture is available. And that's where we got to try and keep your soil temperatures. So us up here, we got to cut higher. We got to seed. Um, I like aerating, then seeding. And that's what I'm doing right now. 113, you're going to see soil bacteria starts to die. If this temperature raises and goes down slowly, what you'll find is the bacterial create cysts, the microorganisms like the protozoal will create cysts. And what they're doing is they're going to protection mode. But if you get too much bacteria going in protection mode, they, they produce a glue that goes hydroscopic and it doesn't allow infiltration. But at the same time, if everything starts drying out from wherever your hard pan might've been at two inches to three inches to four inches, if there was water in there and it starts evaporating, on top of that hard pan are your salts from all those fertilizers that you guys been using. It'll actually come percolating up through and it'll destroy even more life that way. Yeah, and you'll get into a lot more problems. You get into the fungus now shifting from, and James could tell you that, uh, he, James talked and you'll get a, a slide a little down the road. James talked with John Kemp and they were showing how fusarium is a ben actual beneficial until issues like this arise when disturbances within the soil start shifting, now what the disease or an insect will do is because you don't have enough organic matter, enough life within the soil, it'll start wiping out the weak. And that weak is gonna turn into organic matter. So you gotta watch your soil temperatures. This is a great chart to have on hand to show the, um, your consumer or you know, their team. Long and short, I bring a petrometer out too. I don't have it in here. It's, it tells me the compaction at 300 PSI, nothing, and very little will penetrate through that. And that's your hard pan. That's where everything's going to stop. That's where your salts are going to stop. That's where your roots are going to stop. And your roots won't even go near that because that's where all the salts are. And the salts and the biology down there are anaerobic, going to create alcohols, aldehyde, going to keep everything away. Now that's where your disease starts shifting and that's where your biology starts 
turning into disease and that's when you're gonna get you know brown patch, summer patch. I haven't had, I'm knocking on wood, I haven't had disease on my lawns, I think since I started this. Last year of, of 2 million square feet, I probably had about 12,000 square feet that had grub signs and those are new lawns. Uh, this is a winery I take care of, this is Peller. And this is about 40,000 square feet in this one area and they have food trucks on this. This is regenerative, there's clover out there, there's dandelion and there's crabgrass up along the edge. But the thing is that we're very visual and if we can reduce the impact of why those are growing there, we can reduce the outcome, which means that the, the guy up top that loves me, I've been there for uh, 25 years, uh, I'm still there, so I'm doing something right. Look at the dandelion in the end zone here, but look out the middle of the field. And you still got some, but there's nothing. This one, this field here, there's a scoreboard in the far back right. Uh, it was really, I don't know, our cutters up here, this is a Catholic school board I take care of. We got seven sport fields up here. I actually aerate these fields and I pull a harrow right behind it to scrape up or scratch up any um, weeds such as young weeds, not like these, but young weeds to, you know, loosen it up and get more air in through the surface. So this is telling me I don't have enough or I'm just starting with my mycorrhizal. And I, the calcium is still not there, but it's not the entire field. And again, the cutters, I, these cutters are hackers. They go from fence to fence with the biggest machine possible out there. So I'm dealing with ruts. I'm dealing with fixing all that stuff. So yeah, they create more havoc than what they should. But like I was saying on the back sign there, there was an area there um, about 5,000 square feet where it was just bare open soil and always ponding. And the consumers are, or the homeowners here were always complaining. So it took four years and it's fully fixed. And I mean, this, when you, you I don't have a before picture, I, I should have put it in here. This is last year. And there's, the other day we had a huge rain event. We had uh, 20 uh, mils of rain. And I went out there, sure, we had soppy field. But what I found when I started doing this field, we started getting better infiltration. Weed started going away from annuals to perennials, such as we've got there. We started seeing reduction. The turf started taking off and growing. Our biology started picking up because we take soil samples of every property we do. We look underneath the microscope and we look at what uh, biomass ratio of bacteria to fungus, what the nematodes look like, um, how many are in there, and basically the uh, protozoa, which protozoa in there. Everything is a telltale of an outcome on this field. But what I was going to get to is what I found with this field is that the water is going down, but it's not moving off the field well enough because I, I only do the field. So the outside of the field is almost like a barrier holding the water in. So now I'm doing little sections off the field to the ditch line on the, the far right there so the water can actually run off better. But yeah, we got great infiltration. We don't have water standing on that field anymore. Uh, this was our first brew from this year. I know I'm glazing over a lot because I know you guys know really a lot. And I, what I'm gonna introduce to you here is what I call my nature's brew. It's basically, basically biology, some fish, um, a lunchbox going out with the biology and the plant and my lunchbox, meaning that it's very minimal. A little is more. That's my adage. You've got to put a little on because as soon as you start dumping on that heavier product, the heavier fertilizers, you're going to disassociate that biology. You're going to wipe the biology out and you're going to create that plant dependent upon you. So that plant's looking for the next buffet. So it's like going to the buffet with your buddy and he just sits there all day eating. And that's what that plant's gonna happen. Um, and at the same time, the bricks level will shift on you. It'll go a little lower. And I'm gonna get to that a little in a bit. This is Oaks Park. This is gonna be where one of the Canada's games is playing at. Uh, right next door to it is the baseball diamond. They ripped the sod off, they ripped this, uh, the grass off, sorry. 
and now I'm going to go up and do infiltration tests on it. I'm going to do compaction testing. They put new drainage in there. So, and I got to check the organic. I'll do a chemistry test on it. Uh, we'll look at everything and I'll take uh, soil samples and we'll look at what the biology said. Of. But it hasn't had any turf on it yet and it won't. So as soon as you take that turf away, what feeds your biology? Nothing. So what's happening? Everything's shifting to anaerobic, which means as soon as they put that sod on from a chemical field, we're gonna have issues. So before that sod goes on, I go back, I take this stuff and I spray it right in the roots and I'm gonna put mycorrhizal in with it. When they put the sod on, I'll come back after the sod and put another application on because we want those endophytes on the leaf. We wanted them, we want that plant to come out of stress from being cut at the root, coming off a chemical field at a buffet, and we want them to start enjoying that track and getting out there and getting into the sun and start building a relationship within that soil. This is a uh, soccer field in St. Catharines we started. So we're doing this one closest to us, the guys out there, we hand spray this, we don't use any machines. I, I, I pay the guy by the hour, go do her. And then on the other side is another sport field and we're showing them how well our product can actually do in compared to their outcomes. So talking to um, St. Catharines here, this is where I live. I know the mayor, I know everybody here. I've been talking to them for 25 years. Uh, we should be shifting. We finally started doing this field last year. And that's only because of, I don't know, the planet looking at global climate. And by the way, CO2 coming off the grass or off our lawns is, is not part of the climate. It is actually the moisture coming off the ag fields or empty fields with no uh, turf or no foliage on it. Foliage. Uh, plants growing from it. It's just evaporation, excessive moisture sorry, in the atmosphere. This is one of the sports fields here in St. Catharines. And you can kind of see the running from these packers. Um, a lot of the, well, if there's any guys out there cutting, take more pride in your job. If you're, if you're already doing it, perfect. If you're not, man, step up. Because some of these guys blame me all the time that the outcome is because I'm not putting enough fertilizer on. Well, just, uh, yeah, yet they could change the direction. They won't because, again, this is a school board with a very minimal budget. I fully understand. Do it the easiest way, back and forth. But change the directions. The ruts are showing up. And so you're going to get ankle to knee to hip injuries. And I'm not going to go out there and try and pound the crap out of it with a lawn roller. I do a light one, but that's just going to restrict it, shifting the biology, causing more weeds to come up to what? break open the soil. So I aerate after it. I'm still gonna have issues in between. Let me get into the bit of the, the insects and disease. You know, their outcomes, just like the weeds, our soil is broken. Insects only feed on unfit, uh, nutritionally poor, dead or dying plants. We think we're fertilizing them, but we're committing a slow death to them. You know, the quickest way to determine plant health is to test you if you've never used a refractometer, I can get you some information, but there's a link here and I can give uh, Barry the link too, of Thomas M. Dykstra. He's out of Florida and he's helped a lot of the orange uh, orchards down there come through and understand that, like, uh, let me see, let me get into what he said here. Advisor is a trained entomologist. For years, Tom has been illuminating farmers to the science behind insect pressure and demonstrating why insects do not and cannot attack healthy plants. And that could be with the lawns too. Now, when you go regenerative, you're picking up the health, you're picking up the association with the plants, you're picking up the ethylene, you're picking up all these different uh, minerals, nutrients that the plant needs and the plant's gonna be stronger for you. You're not gonna have the insects. Like I say, I had like five or six homes last year. Up here, I use a product with neem oil in it for my chinch bug and grubs. And that just reduces them. I'm on a new lawn today. And uh, they were with me probably 15 years ago and they've had enough of the skunks digging. I show up today, do a light aeration, put some seed on for them. We have a uh, store up here we call Canadian Tire. You can go to a hardware store or a uh, bass outlet would probably be good for you guys. Look for coyote or fox urine. So if you got anything digging, 
I use Q-tips. You put it in the fox urine and you put it around the perimeter. That is a predatorial smell. It'll keep the skunks, the raccoons, the possums away from that area. You know, I used to use uh, moth crystals too. Uh, I don't know where they went, but the, I found that the our coyote urine is only $15 in the hunting department here in our Canadian tire. So I pick a bottle on it up. If someone's got a, something digging, I just drop it off and go to town. Okay, so using insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and even the fertilizer lowers the leaf bricks. Go figure, right? Creating the reason why the insects and disease are there. But understand that when you put a fertilizer on, for every microgram of nitrogen going on, the bacteria will eat five micrograms of organic matter. So in excess, you're pumping that thing up like it's on caffeine and it's gonna go and eat. So what you're doing is you're putting fertilizer on, feeding that bacteria to eat that organic matter, which is actually blown off as CO2, but the plant is receiving high test fuel like at a banquet and it's gonna get drunk. It's gonna have insect issues. So when you keep putting those salts, those fungicides, herbicides on, you're knocking out the population of what's down there. The worm population goes down, your natural aerators. And for some homes, we have uh, a place over here called Pete's Tackle uh, Fishing Outlet. Go get your native worms that they'll sell at these places and put them on a dusk. Put the worms back into the loop. Right away, you're gonna get those things within uh, six months having babies and they're gonna be there forever as long as you don't use this stuff. Those worms will start cycling through your soil, increasing infiltration, putting an elixir of life back into the soil, which is their castings, the bacteria, pseudonomads, um, all the minerals. Oh, it's just a wonder, like, again, I'm out my lawn, I got worms everywhere. I don't roll my lawn anymore. Uh, I hate it though, it's bumpy when I cut it. It's something I take for the pleasure of having a thick lawn, at it. not this time of year, but when it gets thick, I don't feel it. But yeah, we have a lot of worms. Um, at any time at the end, we're gonna um, have uh, questions and answers. Just remember what you're gonna ask and I hope they can answer everything for you. But this is uh, Tom. He figured it all out, guys. Um, if you can get your bricks and you can look at the plant and you can get your bricks up. And I've got a video to show you of uh, Nicole Masters. I took her course a couple of years ago. She's an ecologist. I forget what her title is, but she was from Australia. She's in the Midwest. Along the short, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And this is even a, a cheat. I mean, it tells you where all your insects are going to show up. And by increasing the bricks, you don't have insects. I can get my turf up to the 12 to 13. I haven't seen it up to the 15, 16. New lawns are going to be down by the four and five. Uh, I don't have my refractor meter here. It's in my actual truck. Very simple to use. Once you start using these extra tools, you'll start. Uh, hold on, I'm looking for things. <laughs> you'll start engaging in some more. So, as you saw, uh, we check with infrared temperatures. So, this one actually does a lot more, which I like. It was only about 20 bucks. So, we start getting these little things and start being observant. And that's what Dr. David Johnson of New Mexico State University taught me when I talked to him a few years ago. He said, anything you do has an outcome observe you know it's it look at the weeds look at the plant look at the space like the thin spots look at the compaction take a petrometer uh, check out the compaction look at your infiltration rates take a shovel don't be afraid to dig open that ground and look at where your organic matter is look at the soil structure look at the tilt in there Okay, so reducing inputs, inputs that negatively harm all will allow for some insects to show up. Now, there was a conversation, uh, a podcast I listened to with John Kemp, and I forget the gentleman's name, Joe Lewis, or not Joe Lewis, but Mr. Lewis. He's a professor, and he was saying having some insects there, and there's other uh, PhDs I was talking to too, having some insects there, and this is on our lawns, for every bad insect, there is a parasitic wasp that'll come in and take them out naturally. So you're just having some insects there allowing, 
you know, like, yeah, we see some chinch bugs. Yeah, I'll put some neem oil on there. Neem oil does take out some of the beneficials too. But what I'm saying is when you start going regenerative, you start getting more spiders. You start getting more worms. You start getting more ladybugs. You start getting more parasitic wasps. I mean, there's more good out there than there are bad. I think there's only 1,700 bad insects out there. And the rest of them are all good. But every time we put on an application, we broad spectrum everything and we knock the crap out of everything. And the first thing that comes back is the bad, always. Not sure if you guys ever saw the soil food web. Basically, it starts with the bacteria, then fungus. Then you had your uh, protozoa and the nematodes. But the most important of all this, you got to get our fungus back in there. Everything that we did to the soil disturbed that fungus. The fungus associated with the actual plant, that's the um, arbuscular, so your mycorrhizal. I get mycorrhizal, um, Mike Anthemanthus. Um, I've got it over there. I've got uh, 50 pounds. I'll start putting that on the, the field coming up soon. Uh, you've got to get it on. Again, if you're going to put it on, what I do is I aerate, I seed, and then I spray with my biology, my fish, my kelp, sea salt. And then the sea salt, I don't put that much on. I only put it a cup to a hectare. Hectare is 109,000 square feet. A liter of kelp, four liters of fish, four liters of EM. Again, guys, this is my recipe. Everything changes to your environment. It's all in context. So you, what you do is you start with something, you follow it, observe it, and then you change it a bit. It didn't do much, but well, you might need to aerate again. But again, with mycorrhizal, I would aerate, I would seed. You can either coat the seed with it. I found that difficult, so I just spray it on. Uh, and in my tank now, uh, as of this year, I got a sump pump. And uh, you know, with a Venturi, and I'm not sure if you guys know what a Venturi is. Flow is this way. And what it'll do on the sump pump, I got a, a DCAC uh, guy inside my truck. Oops. Anyways. And there's a ball, there's a seal in there, it pulls in air and I've got an outside line. So when the air comes in, it bubbles my tank. And so a lot of times with your biology, it, uh, as you know, if you don't have an agitator, which I never liked that T-Jet agitator in my tank, this here bubbles everything and floats, it gets everything back up. So you know you're gonna get a better um, distribution or better out the, out the tank type of spray. Again, if you guys need any of this stuff or need any help, I'm always here. Uh, don't inundate me with a lot, but uh, I'm here. It's our time, it's our busy time of year too here. Uh, disease as insects are an outcome of broken dirt, unbalanced, lack of organic matter. And again, unbalanced meaning successionally guys, successionally, or girls, sorry. Um, successionally meaning we're at the lower end, anaerobic, you're gonna get the biology that's producing nitrates, Grass needs a one-to-one -one, uh, bacteria to fungus. And basically what we do is we measure, we've got two microscopes, we measure everything in here. And we know by measuring our lawns within April, we're doing everybody's lawn now, every sport field, we just take one core sample and that's indicative of what we feel the lawn is gonna be. We take it from the worst site. The worst spot. So when we take it from the worst spot, we look at that. We say, if we can fix that, everything else is just going to be gold. Um, and so I then take another sample in October. That's the last time we put our last application on. We do it before that. And what we'll find is we we've, we've got that nice line going up. We got the fungus. We got the nematodes. We got the protozoa. We have a data sheet here. I took uh, as Barry did Dr. Elaine Ingham's course. Um, so we. We do everything in house here. Uh, you guys can do this too. It's very simple. If there's any course coming up, I will be taking another one. And that is uh, with this guy here. This is another book that you should look at. I took this course in the fall. I'm taking the course again. Once you become a basically a member of this guy, Matt Powers, great. He knows everything. Um, and what I like about Matt, outside of Elaine and um, everyone around the planet. He pulls 
all of their information and puts it in the book. I mean, you've got every PhD, all his information pulled together. So when you go in here, if you got a problem with chlorine, he's got a full page on chlorine and then toxicity, deficiency. And on the other side, what to do? I mean, you guys, molybdenum, and then, yeah, toxicity levels. It, we're not supposed to remember all this. You know, we created pen and paper for a reason. So buy that book. It's about $40, $50. The other book that you should always have is this one too. It's another great book. The Matt's going to have a course coming up in the, uh, I think, June on microscopy. And it's, it's just going deeper than what Elaine could do. But it's starting up the bases again. I love doing this every winter. I tear my business apart uh, every November. I tear it apart and see how, how I can do it better. And with the fuel, the best thing I did was go with those two liter diesels. It's only $10 a hundred. Well, now it's 15, $15 to $18, a hundred kilometers. And then if I had a North American vehicle, unfortunately I'd be paying 20 to 25, a hundred kilometers up here. Sorry, I digress, I, I shot off. There's a couple of funguses out there, and the one that you've got to look at is the saprophytic fungus. Um, and then what that saprophytic fungus is, is if you guys go to your uh, flower beds, and girls, sorry, if I, I generalize, so the guys means guys and girls, sorry. Um, the long and the short, saprophytic fungus, if there wasn't any of that anywhere, you would have debris everywhere. Not a tree, not a wood chip would break down. So go to your wood chip uh, flower beds, look in there. It's all that white mycelium. That's what that is, saprophytic. Now, what happens is that fungus is everywhere. The mycorrhizal is on 90% of the plant life. That's endo and ecto. Ecto is more the trees. Uh, endo is more um, the turf in our plants. Uh, what was funny over this past winter, I found out that our cedars are endo, which is turf related, uh, where my trees, my walnuts and all that are ecto, which um, like the uh, puffball mushroom, we get them a lot back here and we eat those. But again, I digress, sorry. So saprophytic fungus, that's the character in your soil, like physarium, that's breaking down things, mutualized, it's a mutualist with your plant. But if it's disturbed soil, that'll change into a pathogen quite simply. So you've got to watch out for what you're doing and how you're disturbing your soil. This one here is that uh, John Kemp. Okay, microbes uh, convert soil pathogens into beneficials. If you've got a chance, listen to that. I listen to it while I'm out on the road. Um, you pick up something new every time you listen through. Again, this is uh, with James White. It's just a different way uh, he was he was talking about the end of fights, but he was going into how bacteria can control pathogens and create a mutualistic uh, relationship from the bacteria to the plant. Really deep, and it and it's not like you won't understand it. You have to understand if I'm trying, if Mike Stangle can understand it, it's idiot proof. I mean, you can. It's it's very simple. Okay, so this is uh, the microscope view. That's fungus. That's a great piece of fungus. This is what you'd want to see in your soil. To the left of it, there's a protozoa in a, uh, yeah, he's there. There's some spores in there. Um, so 90%, we were just talking about the mycorrhizal. I know I'm jumping all over it. Uh, dandelion is associated. So I found that out from a, uh, a writer out of Alaska. I forget the book. That was three years ago. I found out that the dandelion it's a lower successional plant. So it's telling you the, the fungus is coming up. So when we look on the uh, microscope at a lawn that just started, and we find, we do what we call a soil health calculation. We use a zero to 100. We find them at 10 to 20%. That's life support. When we find you at 50%, you're good. When you find you at 100%, you're almost perfect. But the thing is, you can grow up to 300% and it looked like you fertilized the guy's lawn. It's, it's just, all you've got to do is make your plant happy after that. Have I gotten there yet to the 300? No, I'm at 100, 150 on some of my lawns. And then again, um, talking about consumers, consumers are very visual oriented, we all are. That's why we bought that shirt, that car, whatever. 
The thing is that if they don't see the grass growing fast enough at times, they don't think our product's working because they're so used to seeing fertilizer. We don't see the weed dying off. They don't think it's working because a herbicide would kill it off. Okay, and if they don't see the outcome quick enough, they'll just jump ship and go somewhere else. And that's what we call uh, a red ocean market where everybody's fighting for those guys. And that's why I got away from the conventional. I went to a blue ocean where I could make my own rules. Uh, long and short, that's another thing. That's, I took a business course up at our local university and uh, the group up there ripped my business apart and taught me a lot. That's what I do every winter, guys, uh, girls. I rip the business apart and I look at what I don't know. And the fact that I know 99%, that 1% that I don't know is another 99% I need to know. But the thing is that there's so many of us out there that are here to help you. So don't hesitate. I don't have all the answers. But again, this picture, if you look, I should have had an arrow there. There's mycorrhizal associated to that grass root. Uh, and there's a spore on the outside. It's the black dot. There's some up the top there. But yeah, you can't just point at the camera and say it's over there. But anyways, it's there. Again, uh, there, I did do it. Oh, I should have looked at head. <laughs> Okay, so that's mycorrhizal. And basically that's associated, that's the arbuscular. So it's got into the plant and it's mining outside. And that plant is dictating to that mycorrhizal. And I was talking to a guy out of Israel over the winter, I was reading one of his books and I looked at it and I said, wouldn't you consider that a form of currency in the soil? Why is that plant photosynthesizing? It's actually producing exudates, right? So that exudate's going down. It's not only for the bacteria, it's not only to attract, it's not only for the, the, the fungus, it's for a lot. So that's like a currency. So if we can pick up the currency of photosynthesis, you're gonna get a better outcome because it'll be able to barter in the soil for more than what it needs. It'll always have ample. And then, um, ah, my head was going on a tangent there. So there it is again, there's another one. And that's it within the root. This is uh, an inexpensive microscope, guys. It's only five girls, five hundred dollars. Uh, and I hired a young man from our local university uh, who took uh, environmental sciences. So I took the course. I don't have time for this all day. All day. So he's been with me eight years. He does all the testing for me. He's in arm's length. He's my devil's advocate. He keeps me straight and narrow. Uh, again. If we're looking at this, that fish just went from there to there. So I'd rather have someone else look at it. Okay, we're talking about Mike. Do we have enough time, Barry? I, oh yeah, okay. Okay, I, did, I can't hear you though, sorry. Uh, so this is Dr. James White. This is the rhizal phage cycle. I just kind of went on it with the micro, um, mycorrhizal. Um, that's root eating, basically. So this is really important. You guys should go back and, girls, you should go back and watch this video. Uh, you'll get a lot from it. And this will teach us so much more. This is the nitrogen. So as that root is pushing super oxide out to rip off the cell wall, which is the amino acids, proteins that that plant requires, that plant is sending out to protect itself ethylene and nitrogen. So think about that. That plant figured out how to get what it needed, the carbon and the nitrogen, by sending out superoxide. And then that bacteria or yeast or fungus is sending, well, more so bacteria, that bacteria is sending out nitrogen and ethylene, which is a growth hormone, as you guys know. But there's your nitrogen cycle right there. You've got 78% of the atmosphere N2. So yeah, here I am saying it again. Again, go look at that video. They tracked it, they figured it all out. This is the one I wanted to get into. 78% of the atmosphere, 74,000 tons is nitrogen and it's free. If an alien came to this planet, they would think we're nitrogen based, not oxygen based, but yet the plant, and the, since the turn of the planet, has figured out how to grow in symbiosis and association with life. And yet we've come in since the industrial revolution, 
with Joseph Vine Liebig, who created the fertilizer in 1840. So we're using NPK technology from 1840. I think our technology is advanced in telephone, video, or automobile, but yet agronomy is still based on NPK from 1840 because they had a surge in population growth and they wanted to help the farmers because they were tilling too much and they weren't getting the outcome they liked. So they put a chemical on and they got the outcome. As Barry can tell you, Dr. Elaine Ingham will tell you of a story that when they were doing ammunitions, they had the spent ammunitions they were throwing outside and they noticed it, it was growing bigger plants, but they didn't notice it was weeds. They just noticed it was growing bigger plants and the introduction into corn in the South was uh, the Second World War, right? So what happens is that your fertilizer factories, why they won't get rid of fertilizer? Because it's an ammunition factory, simple as that. And it's petroleum based. Those guys still wanna make money somehow. Trichomes, uh, this is a uh, trichome on a leaf. So it's like little hairs, you know, when we grow scruff in our face, obviously these do a lot more. Just like in the root, the rhizophagy, you get it happening. And that's where the cycling of nitrogen from the atmosphere is gonna happen too. Now, when you use these biology, this biology, like what I do, my nitro, uh, sorry, nature's brew, when we put that on, we're putting endophytes on, we're putting all of that. And I'm gonna show you soon, okay. This was last year. Obviously the house on the left is ours. The house on the right is a fertilizer and spray. Looks great, not a weed on that lawn. <laughs> Little, you know, heat stress. But look at ours, we got some clover, we got some dandelions there, we got plantain too. One application, I, and adjusting their cutting height, they don't water, none of these people water. Don't let them lie to you, they don't water. The point is that salt on the right, and yeah, you can see, picture tells a, a lot more. Okay, so I picked up this house, bad infiltration. As you can see in the top right, April 20 picture, that's flooded. But look at the biology. This is what I was talking about, the biomass. So I have everybody's data going back since they started in uh, 2018, we started doing this. Every brew I've ever done since 2014, I have the data, except for last year, I've got enough data in the number of years to show me that I'm moving forward. I only go and uh, take test my stuff once a month now. Uh, but the, here's the example. The, uh, the fungus should be one to one, not 0.1, that's 19%. Then we're up to 34, that's May 20th, the dogs love in the backyard. And here it is in June 21, we're at 45%. Sure, it took a bit of time and it does, but there's no ponding water in the backyard, she loves that. And at the same time, we look at the color and the thickness of that lawn. Definitely we could use aeration, a little more organic matter, but these are all things that uh, I could, don't like to use the word upsell, but this is all. But then I don't want the consumer, I'm very price conscious, so I don't push anything more than they can, what their budget can afford, because the product can do it. And if they're willing over a period of time, we can get it done. Just sit back and smell the coffee. Here's another one. So this is, uh, what is this, April? Yeah, April 18, 19, and 20. Definitely, we could do a lot more here, but the thing is, all they wanted to do was the applications. But you can see your snow mold up in the top left and how it transitioned from 18 to 20. So what's that, 24 months? In 24 months, that was the greenest lawn once it came into summer on the street where everybody else didn't water. Yes, they do have an irrigation system, but the point being it's the resilience increase, the infiltration increase, and everybody else around them looked around. This is a good friend, uh, mentor, Dr. Uh, uh, David Johnson. He's the creator of the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor. Got, I caught up. By the way, uh, the farmers know everything. The regenerative farmers, they got everything. And I go to the, uh, uh, that's no tills in the plains. I went down to Kansas in 2018 or 19, 18, I think, 19, can't remember, before COVID anyways. And it was star studded with everybody there. I got to sit and talk and chat, meet, and go over everything. And then that one there, uh, green cover seat in the background, I still communicate with them. Uh, great guys, they have a lot of videos like Barry's doing too, if you wanted to go see their videos. But the thing is that the regenerative community is so outpouring with information. I'm here for you. 
don't hesitate to contact. It's not hard to do. Um, what I'm getting at, this is what I, my fall leaves. I make a compost out of it. I put it in my truck. That's my three liter Toyota uh, from Japan. I fill it with leaves. Then I wet it. I let it drain. And then I put in this, what we call a bioreactor. I fill it up, but there's tubes in the bioreactor too. Um, and I'm down there in the bottom, you can see that it's full of in the fights, 2,400 plus bacteria, four to 500 fungal. Actually, that's 2,700. It should have been protozoa, nematodes, micro, macro, everything. The one thing you might not know is what autoinducers are. That's basically quorum sensing. So bacteria doesn't have eyes, doesn't have a mouth, can't communicate. So what it does, it puts enzymes and acids out. And it communicates that way. So those are autoinducers. So from day one to 60 weeks, it takes me to make that finish. You've got communication of everything happening. And it's actually stored in the compost. It's there. So we've got a Diane and uh, Ian Haggerty in uh, the west of Australia. They're in a desert dry location. They do wheat on 30,000 plus hectares. This is 109,000 square feet per hectare. And they put worm juice on and this. And they get the wheat growing without water. What I'm telling you is the life within the soil, and it's more so that autoinducer. Autoinducers are in humic too, and fulvic, because that's ancient um, decomposed uh, critters. But along the short, what I'm going to say is that in there, when you coat your seed with this or a biology, more so this one, because in the and when you get a biology and you jug, you're missing out on the autoinducers. The end of fights will come out, and the only way they can communicate is by autoinducers. And when they get that autoinducer, they, they can find out that the communication from day one to 60 weeks is there. They know everybody's there and partying, but yet it's not. It's a false flag. But the thing is that the autoinducer is telling you, and that plant will take off, and it'll start sending out exudates in biology to mine what it needs and then pull it back in through the rhizophagy cycle. That's so what Mike, it looks like. Mike, I'm going to interrupt and, and play a little devil's advocate here. Sure. <laughs> um, Going back 15 some odd years or so, um, you know, Elaine, Elaine was touring the East Coast and everything, and, uh, and you know, there was a lot of information and excitement going on about compost teas. Um, unfortunately, I think that most people who tried it didn't really understand it or how to properly make it and test for it. Yeah. And because of that, it kind of, you know, fell out of vogue and, you know, one of the reasons for bringing you in and some of the other people we've had is to, to reinvigorate this information. It, it's, it's not easy to do, but there is a process and there are more people out there that are willing to share this information. So, um, you know, I would encourage anybody who's listening to, you know, follow up and if we can hook you up with somebody who can help you make your own magic tea or whatever, uh, we'll be glad to do so. So, thank you we, very much. So you want to have some closing statements? Oh, we're going, okay. I make extracts. I don't make a tea. Don't do teas yeah. like Barry's saying. I make an extract. Uh, I've just buzzed through. There it is. There's some life. There's not many left. That's Gretzky's. Uh, again, I found this new tool. I kill oh, my yeah. weed. There you go. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go back to that weed color. You were, we were talking about that earlier today. Yeah, so this guy here, infrared, ultraviolet light. Uh, you can take it from interlock, in flower beds, anywhere. It takes nine seconds. It zaps high intensity light with a bit of heat. The heat actually is intense. Um, and it'll kill it within 10 days. Uh, and it'll kill it right down to the root. So wherever the plant is from interlock, like say current corner curve. I love it. Uh, I started using it a couple of weeks ago and I got evidence on moss. So it was good. What's but moss is uh, high aluminum. What's it called, Michael? Uh, this one here is uh, Weedy Race. Thanks. And I, they do it in the, um, the ag, ag industry. So if you want the link to it, I can give you the link. Um, the ag, this was an ag industry, and it, they shifted over a couple of years ago. And last year, they had some issues with the chips I was mentioning to Barry. Yeah. And, and that's, that is corded. It's not battery operated, right? 
So this one is a cord. They remember they last year they had that factory with the chip. It blew up. Yeah. Right. Cars get the chips first, so they're redesigning it, and they're going to have right off the shelf, like from your Ronas or your uh, Home Depots, battery pack goes right in it. So stuff technology already on the shelf that's going to incorporate. Okay. So cool. I'm in close proximity proximity with the, the company because I got the rights up here in Canada. Okay, cool. So we, we did have a few questions. Uh, Diana, oh. you want to you want to take sure. them out? So uh, John Raffiani says. Please comment further. Mycorrhiza, uh, mycorrhizal fungi does not assist weeds in general? Question mark. No, they don't. They'll mine them for the, uh, okay. Successfully, weeds are anaerobic. Fungus is aerobic. So as soon as you start shifting, the chemistry starts shifting. The fungus mines those lower successional plants. Boom, they're gone. You've got to get the health in general on the whole shifting to successionally positive. And that's what fungus is telling you. So when we go up the ladder, we're showing that one picture, we had no weeds in that uh, backyard. But again, you'll get weeds like along the edge where they put something on for the snow or um, they wanted to put Javix on there to kill the weed off instead of using this. Did that help? It, it, if you get the mycorrhizal on there, it'll mine the lower successional plants and at the same time improve the soil, taking away the job of that weed for scavenge for minerals and producing organic matter. Okay, uh, John has a couple more questions. Uh, what mycorrhizal products do you use? I'm right now using uh, Mike Anthemanthus. I can't pronounce this. Uh, it's the um, one out of Oregon. Am I saying the name right, Barry? I can't say that last name. Dr. Mike, um, look up Dr. Mike. Right, yep. <laughs> the other question is, for those diggers, ever try cayenne pepper and baby powder combined? No, it, it, that would take too much time for me. It's, uh, for me, simpler just to buy a container for $15, throw it on their lap, Q-tip it. It works beautifully. We did that on the sod fields way back in the 80s. That's where I got it from. Okay, so can you repeat the name and author of, this is from Amy, can you repeat the uh, name and author of the weed book? Thank you. Yeah, this was done back in the 80s by J.L. Oh, there. Is that straight? Yeah, can you read that? Oh, you can see it then, yep. Yeah. And then, whoop, I think this is the first issue. They've updated it. Some of the stuff in there, they're going to have... Um, two gallons of calcium, two gallons of molasses per acre to control weeds. Don't do that, please. <laughs> molasses will push too much bacteria. It's a simple sugar and you're gonna get more weeds than you want. On a farm field, it worked very well. In the spring, if you put a little more calcium on, I'm only putting one liter of calcium per hectare, but I'm putting amino acids on this year too. And the amino acids are long chain. My son's going through as a chemist right now. He helps me. I, he's in a university. I just let him do all that stuff now. <laughs> yeah. Another good book that I recommend is Teeming with Microbes. Jeff Lowenfels uh, wrote that years ago. And he, he, you know, he started with Lenny Ingham's work and he, and he popularized it so that more people could understand it. Good book to read. That's the, the two books I read from him. That's where the dandelion, I found the information there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I forgot his name. Thank you. Yep. He, he was a great guy when, when he was... Uh, going around the East Coast, I got to meet him a few times. And uh, one time, I, I I had a you know a booth at at some college where we were doing expos and everything. And I he gave his talk, and there was a break, so I, I walked away from my booth for a while. And I came back, <laughs> and he had rigged up and set up just a a little miniature <laughs> microbilator with the water and the air bubbling. <laughs> it's a nice surprise. <laughs> So we're at 8, uh, 8.14 now, so it's almost 8.15. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and, and just go ahead and ask or type them in the chat box and I can ask. Um, and I wanted to mention too that I looked it up and I found Weeds and Why They Grow, uh, and that is uh, online as a PDF, looks like. You can download. Oh, nice. You can also get it from Acres USA. Uh, I'm not sure how much they, that costs. 
But if you get it the PDF, just yeah, watch out for the molasses. Don't use, I don't, this year I'm not using any molasses, any bacterial foods. I want to see if I can shift. And again, this is what happened. You observe, you look, you change your formulation dependent upon what the season last year showed us. So we had some specific weeds come up, which is perennial, but I want to see if I can get rid of any bacterial food and push all fungal food. That's kelp, that's fish. But right now I was mentioned to Barry, I'm doing EM, effective microorganisms with my fish and um, simplifying it into more of an amino acid. Anyways, it's just more science. Yeah. The, um, why, well, well the weed book has been re-released under the title When Weeds Talk. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I can't actually really find it in print um, otherwise, but, but it is under uh, When Weeds Talk. Yeah. So. Yeah, this, so this is the first edition, and then I've got the other ones there. So that's why I say, yeah, it's, it's an old book. Any other questions? Can anybody uh, tell me where they're from? <laughs> Hi, Michael. We're from uh, New Jersey, Barry and I, and Amy. And I just want to thank you for your presentation because I really do appreciate when we have presentations from people that are hands-on and have been there. It makes yeah. all the difference in the world to uh, information and credibility. Yeah, it's, it's you're in lawn care then? Uh, no, we're in irrigation, but we dabble in uh, various things for, for customers and a lot of advice when we have to, because they always seem to come to us for some reason. I do irrigation too. I use all Hunter up here. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what you use, but yeah, thank you for that. Um, I found, you know, if you can do anything after we do those lines, you know, dig, you know, trenching, try to get worm castings back in there just a bit. That's a great idea. You know, um, generally speaking, uh, we just backfill and clean it up nice. Uh, but a sprinkle of worm casting sounds like a good way to go. Yeah, I happen to know where you can get some, John. There you go. Uh, where, where is that, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> and you, you don't need much. Or you can take his worm castings and make an extract out of it and spray it out of a garden hose. I'm telling people, you know, the end, garden end hose, you get one of those, you put some uh, worm castings in there, just turn it on and watch it go out. The thing is that you're going to dilute it. You're going to push all the biology out and it'll do a lot more. Oh, great idea. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Not a problem. Anyone else? No? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much, Michael. We all learned a lot and I'm sure I'll be talking to you in the future and have you do another talk for us. Um, Next week, we're changing a little bit. We, we have Dan Maybe, who's the, uh, um, the head of the American Green Zone Alliance, um, which educates and supplies people on battery operated equipment for landscapers. So um, that's the up and coming thing. And he's been involved from that right from the start. So uh, I hope you guys sign up for that for next week. And we will see you then. Thank you so much for watching. Take Thank care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.